Hi, uh, let me start off by uh, thanking the organizers of this event for inviting me. Um, unfortunately, I have tried to be with you in real time, but um, you know the story with electricity in Gaza. Um, and let me start directly by um, addressing some of the questions uh, um, you know, sent to me when I was, um, when, when I got the invitation. Um, and, you know, the first, uh, the first question was, you know, about the situation in Gaza uh, right now. Uh, you know, we know that Israel, um, um, you know, declared a unilateral ceasefire after pounding, uh, you know, the Palestinians of Gaza with airstrikes for 11 days. Um, and you know that this, um, you know, uh, war plunged the Gaza Strip even deeper into suffering already inflicted by a hermetic, and I would call it genocidal. Uh, I know how sensitive this word is, but I would call it genocidal. My friend Elan Pape calls the blockade, you know, an incremental genocide. Uh, when the, the, the siege was, um, uh, you know, declared in 2007, I remember Richard Falk wrote a piece titled Prelude to Genocide. So we are back to square one right now. Uh, you know, the hermetic siege imposed by apartheid Israel um, and the United States of America. I mean, without the support of the United States of America, you know, Israel wouldn't, you know, be able to impose this, um, this siege. Um, and there are political and military consequences. And the point is that there is an urgent need for activists such as yourselves, activists around the world, to take up the struggle against Israel's apartheid the same way they took the struggle against the inhumane apartheid system of South Africa until it crumbled in 1994 with the election of Nelson Mandela as the first black president of multiracial, multireligious, multicultural South Africa. And this is an indication of, uh, you know, the future that we are hoping to have in Palestine. I mean, very clearly, and I know Jif is there as well, I mean, we are members uh, of the um, one state campaign, you know, we're calling for, you know, a secular democratic state in the, on the, in the historic land of Palestine, because the reality on the ground here between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean is a one state reality controlled by apartheid Israel, you know, with us Palestinians, uh, you know, being oppressed by apartheid Israel, the same way, if not worse, than the way the oppressed Africans of South Africa were treated and, you know, under uh, the, uh, the inhumane apartheid system. And these are not my words, by the way. I mean, I myself spent six, seven years in South Africa um, after the collapse of the apartheid system, but I have you know, I have had all these discussions with anti-apartheid activists who decided to come and visit Palestine, you know, from, you know, Roni Kassar to uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, I mean, including Nelson Mandela himself, all said to me, and they wrote about it, by the way, that what we are witnessing in, uh, in Palestine is far worse than what they had to go through under the apartheid system. And um, so let me just take you uh, uh, back to the ceasefire, which was declared because simply Israel failed to achieve any of its objectives. Yes, destruction, yes. Killed so many people, including 69 children, yes. More than 200 people, including 69 children, and you know, 39 women, yes because Israel knows that it can carry out war crimes and crimes against humanity with full impunity. It did this in 2009, 2000, uh, 2008, 2009, for 22 days, bombarding Gaza with phosphorus bombs, with internationally prohibited weapons. And 
you know, it achieved absolutely nothing at that time. But the point is that the international community did absolutely nothing. And because the international community did absolutely nothing, apartheid Israel felt that it could come back, attack Gaza again in 2012 for a week, killing 200 people and then leaving Gaza. Just like that. And then the international community did absolutely nothing. And therefore, Israel felt that, you know, with that kind of impunity, it can come back 2014 for 51 days, relentless attacks against the civilians of the Gaza Strip. I mean, look, I witnessed those, you know, four massacres, 2009, 2012, 2014, and 2021, and the Great March of Return. In 2014, for 51 days, Israel attacked with phosphorus bombs, you know, Navy, air, etc., land, killing um, more than 200, 2,200 people, including 434 children. Just like that, just like that. And every single person who died has a family, has a name, has a story to tell, has a story to tell. And, and this is why Israel can just attack and then declare a ceasefire. So the ceasefire was declared because as I said, the, po this, the point is that we had to show resistance. I mean, Michel Foucault said, well, wherever you have power, and I think Edward Said repeated it, you have resistance. And so Israel just declared a ceasefire because honestly, it failed to achieve any of its objectives, namely destroying our will to fight, our steadfastness, sumud, resistance in Gaza, and because, I mean, people keep asking me, why is Israel besieging Gaza? Why is Israel targeting Gaza? Because Gaza is a refugee camp. Two thirds of Gazans are refugees entitled to their right of return in accordance with the United Nations Resolution 194. That's what happened in 1948, a process of ethnic cleansing Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians came to Gaza. Now we have eight refugee camps. The majority of Gazans are refugees and therefore they are a reminder of the original sin, the Nakba, the catastrophe that took place in 1948. And that is the essence of Israel's settler colonialism and apartheid, because one of the questions is about, you know, whether Israel is an apartheid or an apartheid state or a human rights watch said it. B'Tselem, Israel's mainstream human rights organization said it. United Nations Esquire report said it, that Israel is an apartheid state. And then three years ago, Israel, you know, passed a law. The Israel Knesset passed a law. The nation state basic law stating that Israel is a state of Jews only. So Israel is the state of Jews, and Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel is not the state of its citizens. So Israel, because of what happened in 2014, because the international community was, and I said remains, complicit. And when I say international community, I'm not talking about international civil society. I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about conscientious people. I'm not talking about civil society. I'm talking about the official bodies of the international community. And again, um, last month in May, they decided to come because, well, they can do that. They can just come, attack Gaza and leave. But this time we showed more resistance. But before I come to that, I mean, we are, as I said, we are back to square one and we will fight in order to change the status quo. And we are fighting to change the status quo. But we still have a 24 hour surveillance by Israeli drones. I can hear the drone right now as I'm speaking to you, um, flying overhead. Uh, we, still, we still hear the F-16s, American made F-16s, Apache helicopters. And by the way, if I look outside my window here, 
um, you know, I can see the, uh, the, the, the gunship in the Mediterranean. Uh, and I don't know whether to call that, you know, commitment to ceasefire or not. What kind of ceasefire are we talking about? I mean, we have to go back to square one, you know, where, uh, you know, we do not have electricity. And this is why I cannot have this conversation in real time with you where um, there's a, you know, a long list of banned items. And if I start telling you what we have on that banned, you know, items on the list, it's, it's, it's a joke. From chocolate to cigarettes, to cows, to pasta. It's a, I mean, let alone medicines and essential things. I mean, Dov Vazglav, the, uh, you know, the advisor to the late Israel Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, he wanted to put, you know, to put us on diet. He wanted, you know, to, you know, to count, to measure the, the you know, the calories that uh, Israel would allow us to consume. I mean, to that extent, to that extent. But, you know, I mean, um, we decided, as I said, to resist. And, uh, you know, it, uh, enough is enough. Enough is enough. What we want, I mean, very simple thing. We issued a statement at the beginning of the latest massacre, as we usually do. Every single time there is a massacre, we issue statements. And the call is very clear. BDS, boycott divestment sanctions. We want you to boycott apartheid Israel the same way you boycotted the apartheid system of South Africa. It is an ob a moral, it is a moral obligation. And we want the international community to, di to divest from Israel and from companies, international companies benefiting from Israel's multi-tiered system of oppression of the Palestinian people, occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, uh, settler colonialism actually, um, apartheid and ethnic cleansing. And we want Security Council and United Nations to impose sanctions. I mean, in accordance with international law to impose sanctions. We want a military embargo. We want a military embargo to be imposed on, um, on apartheid Israel. And, you know, I mean, after and during the latest massacre, some serious questions have been raised. Um, and once again, of course, about, you know, the usefulness of resistance and whether, you know, the outcome of the latest war on Gaza can or cannot be considered a victory for the Palestinian people. And as, as I said, the same questions every single time Gaza or rather Israel attacks Palestinians, people raise the same questions even during the great march of return, because people kept and still are talking about, you know, the price Palestinians have to pay, to pay. It's especially, especially liberals. And once again, we are being challenged by, you know, those same neutral voices that keep talking about, you know, two sides of the story. I mean, the American president, uh, you know, uh, when Israel was slaughtering children, attacking residential towers, wiping out entire families. The American president said, yeah, he supports Israel's right to self-defense. And what about our children? They don't even have that right, by the way. Uh, so still people, you know, liberal voices, Western governments are blaming the two sides of the conflict. I mean, there was no conflict in South Africa. There was no conflict in the American South under the Jim Crow laws, things were black and white, were clear. This is a settler colonial system oppressing the indigenous population of Palestine. So you don't have, you know, two equal sides. You have colonizer and colonized. And every single time they say, you should stop resistance, whether it is BDS because that is anti-Semitism or even launching, you know, firecrackers called rockets by the resistance movement in, um, in the Gaza Strip. But once again, um, we need to be clear. 
When you raise such a questions, that means you accept Israel's narrative that there are two sides to the conflict with equal military power and moral standing. And that is immoral. That is unfair. Now, people who raise these questions reject the reality that this is a Western-backed, settler, colonialist, and apartheid project implanted in the heart of the Middle East, which the Palestinian people are resisting. Um, the same voices also ignore all our moral weapons, that we are the natives of the land, that we have international law supporting our claims, including the claim to the land and our right of return and compensation, that we have the moral high ground, exactly like black South Africans, like African Americans living in the American South under the Jim Crow laws. And we increasingly have the support of international civil society, as you know by now, and others. And then, you know, um, people keep, you know, those liberal voices keep referring, you know, to Palestinian violence, especially in the latest confrontation, you know, last, uh, last month, month. And they refuse to see that the Palestinians are able to be agents of change in their present and future. <coughs> um, so those people who, you know, talk about the two equal sides and blame the victim, they, they are ideologically unable to acknowledge Palestinian agency because they refuse to respect the will of the people as expressed in the popular support, um, you know, given to resistance, given to BDS, given to popular resistance in, in Sheikh Jarrah, in Lud, in Yatha, in Haifa, you know, resistance in its various forms. And as I said, in Gaza, the West Bank, and in 1948. Uh, and I think, you know, it is important to, um, you know, to understand that Gaza 2000, uh, or rather Gaza, what happened in Gaza, last week uh, I, yeah, I want to reach the conclusion that it is a victory because for so many reasons of course because one Israel um, you know failed to achieve any of its objectives it's its objectives but it also what happened is that we managed to destroy you know some of the myths created by apartheid Israel over the time uh, that, you know, Israel has the most moral army in the world, that its Iron Dome, for example, is invincible, that the Palestinians are, you know, just Arabs, not even Palestinians, that Arabs that have no common identity and would give up their claim to the land once the old generation, you know, dies out. Um, it is, and I think, you know, we have managed to prove that we are agents of change. Uh, our BDS call is very clear. And honestly, being a BDS activist, I have always, since the inception of the movement, believed that BDS, yes, it is a tool of struggle, tool of solidarity with the Palestinian people, but at the same time, it has managed to decolonize the Palestinian mind. It has managed to decolonize the Palestinian mind. And our victory last month has managed to solidify that idea that we, all of us, whether in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, that is to say the areas occupied in 1967 or in 1948, or Palestinian refugees living in the diaspora. We are one people. I mean, 
since the, the signing of the Oslo, the disastrous and catastrophic Oslo Accords in 1993, you know, our official leadership and apartheid Israel and America wanted to convince us that uh, Palestinians of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are the Palestinian people. In, uh, in other words, Oslo has managed to reduce the Palestinian people only to those who, uh, you know, living in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. But hey, with what happened in Jerusalem, in Gaza, in Lud, in Haifa, we are turning, you know, uh, turning the table over, upside down. And we are saying, no, let's go back to 1948 with the establishment of apartheid Israel, uh, not to 1967, when Israel decided to occupy the rest of Palestine 22% of historic Palestine. And, um, and I think what happened is that we've managed to redefine the Palestinian people, to redefine the Palestinian people, and again, uh, bring back the three components of the Palestinian people to say, look, this is the Palestinian people. 12 to 14 million people living in historic Palestine and in the diaspora. So what do we want now? We know that Israel is going to come back. Yes, the answer came from Haifa, Lud, Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah. That is irreversible. That is irreversible. And this is why we need a program that represents the three components of the Palestinian people, 1967, 1948, and refugees living in the diaspora. And to my mind, the only solution, the only program that can represent the interests of the Palestinian people in its entirety is the one state solution a secular democratic state, a state for all of its citizens, regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of ethnicity, etc. And I honestly think it's a compromise. And it's a very generous compromise offered by the colonized to the colonizer. I mean, what is wrong, politically speaking, with the with the offer, with the generous offer given by the blacks of South, by Nelson Mandela to, uh, to the whites of South Africa. As much as I'm critical of the solution in South Africa in terms of the socio socioeconomic, you know, dimension, economic apartheid, et cetera, et cetera. But still, I mean, we want equality for all. Equality for all, getting rid by getting rid of the privileges of the settlers, getting rid of Jewish supremacy, and establishing a new reality, a new space between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean to replace the colonial space created by apartheid Israel. And I honestly think that we Palestinians have begun to decolonize, as I said, our minds away from the facade of the two-state solution, the racist two-state solution, the peace industry. And with our sumud, we have managed to establish a new reality. And we have brought the arrogant Zionist regime in Palestine to its knees. Thank you again. Thank you so much for being patient with me. And um, again, I have to apologize for not being able um, to join you. Thank you. I mean, in many ways, uh, Haider uh, said what I have to say. We're both members of the uh, One Democratic State campaign. Uh, and, um, you know, we work very closely together so we have very much of the same analysis, but I want to kind of sharpen certain things uh, that, that Heider said and, and open up some, some dis, uh, area for discussion. First of all, in terms of Gaza, 
I think um, we have to understand a little bit, you know, I want to just say a few words to add to what he said in terms of why Gaza happened and what it, and what it means. Um, I, think, I think the first thing about Gaza was that um, Israel is instrumentalizing the Palestinians. And this is really interesting. Um, and that is, that, you know, as a settler colonial movement, and what's important here, and, and we have to really develop this discourse, settler colonialism is a very powerful analysis. It actually began in Australia with Patrick Wolf and uh, Lorenzo uh, Veracini and others, as you know. Uh, and so when Lisa opened uh, by uh, acknowledging uh, the indigenous land that this uh, conference is, is held on and so on, and linking it to the Palestinians, that's really a very close link. I mean, it isn't just uh, some academic link. It, it's an actual political link um, that unites us because both Aus Australia and Zionism and of course, South Africa. So in a sense, you know, that brings, as Hyder brought South Africa into the discussion, that too, all three of these are settler colonial uh, societies, not to mention the United States as well. So settler colonialism really becomes a central element that unites the struggles. And to the degree that, uh, that South Africa was fairly successful and that in Australia, it's ongoing. Uh, and here, it, there's an ongoing struggle you know, means that settler colonialism has become a very relevant part of the of the discourse. The problem has been until now, for the last 20 years, that it's been confined to the academic circles. You know, there's a lot of discussion about settler colonialism. There's journals about it. There's articles about it. Um, but it had it's only in the last, I would say, in the last six months or maybe a year that it's begun to percolate into the popular discourse, the public discourse, settler colonialism. I just wrote a book, my, my latest book that just came out and uh, deals with that. And it really is trying to present the One Democratic State Campaigns Program. It's called Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, Zionism, Settler Colonialism, and the Case for One Democratic State. Uh, so that, you know, I think what we have to start doing more and more is to explain to people what settler colonialism means. In other words, it's great that this concept is going through. That's a breakthrough. And as Hyder said, its importance is it's reframing the entire thing because this isn't a conflict. We keep talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not a conflict. Conflicts have sides. Right, and we're always talking about both sides. Both sides should end the violence. Both sides should this or that, and both. And and there aren't both sides. Settler colonialism is unilateral. There there isn't another side. When the settlers come to the country, um, uh, they're coming with an entitlement and with an exclusive claim to the country. They're taking over the country. That's the whole thrust of settler colonialism. And in that process, there is no other side. They're not asking the indigenous population. They're not negotiating with the indigenous population. The indigenous population doesn't count. It's not, it's not, it has no rights. It has no, there is no side. And we have to remember that in terms of this struggle as well, because the, the whole idea that we can negotiate, we can, we can use a conflict resolution mechanism to resolve a settler colonial issue is wrong. It just doesn't work, and that's we've seen that for the last thirty years that that this that this approach hasn't worked because there aren't two sides. Israel, until today, from its inception of Zionism one hundred and twenty-five years ago until this moment, has never recognized the existence of a Palestinian people, not to mention its national rights, and it can't. It can't because that would undercut the exclusive settler claim, Zionist claim to the entire country. So once we begin to understand the logic of settler colonialism, its logic and its structures, and that's what we have to get out to the general public more and more, that's what gives us the, the ability to understand the, the actual problem. The problem is not negotiations. The problem is not both sides. The problem is not, the problem is, um, um, you know, that uh, that a settler movement, Zionism, 
has come to, t to Judaize, that's the term it used, to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country, and, and has done it largely. It succeeded until we've gotten today where we are, which is really an apartheid regime. And as Haider says, and this is really an important point, there already is one country. The whole issue of one state, two states is gone. De facto, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River, there's already a single country. You can't get into this country through any borders without going through Israeli border controls. There's one effective army. There's one effective government. There's one economic system. There's one settlement system. There's one infrastructure. There's one water system, electrical system. By any measure, this is already one country. So our, our, our task is clear from our point of view, at least. And that is to transform a single apartheid regime that Israel created into a democratic state of equal rights for all its citizens. So, uh, so, um, so this is the, now the problem with, with settler colonialism, of course, is that resistance is, is, um, uh, is inevitable and resistance is permanent. In other words, the, the, what the settler colonial uh, project tries to do is after a, a very violent process of suppressing the indigenous population and taking its land, the idea is, all right, now we're going to present ourselves as a normal country. And what we want is when people think of Israel, for example, they think of Israel as the you know, beaches, gay Tel Aviv, uh, a normal Jewish country. We're coming here to see, you know, the temple where the temple was and all of this and not think at all of Palestinians to erase, to eliminate the Palestinian presence or the Arab character of the country whatsoever. Um, that's really the process. And, and, in, and, and part of that process is not only erasing the Palestinian presence, but it's instrumentalizing it. In other words, Israel hasn't managed to get rid of the Arabs. You know, the majority population of this country today is Palestinian. It hasn't managed to eliminate um, uh, resistance. So what it does by instrumentalizing Palestinians is that it's criminalized resistance by erasing any kind of political context so that Gaza is not a political thing. Gaza is a Hamas terrorist movement throwing rockets on Israel just because they hate Jews. That's the, that's the framing, you see. And so what that does by, by erasing and eliminating the political context, the settler colonial context, the, fun, the foundational violence that Israel committed against the Palestinians by displacing them and taking their land, it, it decontextualizes and criminalizes so that all Palestinian resistance simply becomes terrorism. And of course, uh, that has tremendous... Uh, uh, traction in the world, and so that's what that's what really part of Gaza was was to was to was to instrumentalize Hamas by presenting it as a criminal terrorist movement, and therefore, um, and therefore, bolstering Israel's claim that it has a right to defend itself. By and under that cover, of course, comes the occupation, which is, becomes a part of Israel as well. That's part of it. A second part of Gaza, by the way, has to do with, um, with uh, you know, I wrote another book called War Against the People, where I, I say that Gaza, especially, and also the West Bank, is really a laboratory for Israel perfecting and developing weapon systems, surveillance systems, uh, military technologies of repression that it then exports. So in many ways, actually, Gaza uh, the whole Gaza uh, attack of those 11 days was a military exercise. It was a, it was a testing of all kinds of new equipment. Haider mentioned some of it. I mean, high phosphorus weapons, but also F-35s, new navigating systems, new tactics, and so on, um, that, uh, that are then, um, you know, the, the whole issue of the tunnels, you know, a whole tunnel technology that was developed. Um, that's then that's then exported. 
So it had little to do with actually Gaza itself. It had to do with using Gaza, instrumentalizing Gaza in order to promote a military industry. And one other uh, thing behind Gaza, of course, was the, um, was the election, the Israeli election. And that, that's, that's also a context where Netanyahu, who's facing a new government that's not quite in place yet, but this week we should have a new government, a right-wing government, but nevertheless uh, getting rid of Netanyahu, which is its only agenda. Um, uh, so, so, so Netanyahu is trying to instrumentalize not just Palestinians, but religion uh, in order to create a, a, an atmosphere in which the Islamic party uh, will not join the new government. And that's where the attacks on Sheikh Jarrah happened, the attacks on Al-Aqsa, culminating in the attack on Gaza. In other words, in other words, the best way, from the, the most powerful way for Netanyahu to polarize, especially an Islamic party, is by attacking religion, by attacking religious sites. And that was, and in order to create an atmosphere in which the Islamic party can never join any Israeli government, not only the Netanyahu's, but also the opposition. And without the Islamic party, then we're facing another round of elections. And that's what Netanyahu wants, because as long as he can keep elections going, he can stay in power forever. So that's a little bit about the background of Gaza. But again, using Gaza and using these attacks as a way of elaborating the idea of settler colonialism and the logic of all, in other words, we have to help people interpret and understand these specific events that happen according to the logic of settler colonialism. They're not unexpected. They're not unexplainable. They fit into a pattern and we have to help people understand that pattern. Now, I wanna say one more thing in the couple minutes I have left. And that is that, um, and, and I want to again echo what Hyder said, um, ICAD, my organization, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, has always been political. We fight house demolitions on the ground, we resist, we rebuild homes, of course, of, of Palestinians that have been demolished by Israel, but we're always political. The issue is not house demolitions. The issue is using house demolitions as a vehicle for exposing how the occupation works, um, what Israel's intentions are as a leverage point for fighting occupation and fighting what's going on. So we've always been political. And over the years, of course, our political agenda was the two-state solution. That was accepted by the PLO in 1988. And that was maybe for... 10, 15 years, the main agenda. It's been clear now for at least the last 10, maybe 20 years, if, if not more, that the two-state solution is not only gone, but again, if we get into the settler colonial analysis, we understand that there never was a two-state solution because the Zionism came with the purpose of Judaizing the entire country, not 78% of it. So the very idea that a Palestinian state based on Palestinian rights would be established in the heart of our biblical homeland is ridiculous. So we can't say the two-state solution is dead. We have to say the two-state solution never was. And therefore, the only way out of a settler colonial situation, like I said, not negotiations or conflict resolution, the only way out is decolonization dismantling the structures of control and domination that exist, including, as Haider mentioned, colonization of the mind, and replacing that, that apartheid occupation colonial system with a, new, with a new system, a new polity that's based on equal rights for everyone and the right of return of refugees. And again, the importance of the settler colonial analysis is that it expands our view. Over all these years, really, the, we've been talking about occupation and the occupation. That's been the mantra. But the occupation is only 22% of historic Palestine. What about the other 78%? So that what, what settler colonialism does is it expands our view, as Haider was saying, to the entire country. 
The problem is the entire country. And we have to decolonize and we have to have a political solution. We cannot be in a political struggle without a solution, and without a political program, without something to mobilize around. And I want to say one more thing and then I'm going to stop within my 15 minutes. And that is that um, like South Africa, um, the Israeli Jews are not going to be partners in dismantling their own system of apartheid. Why would they? They're they're enjoying they're enjoying uh, the rule, the access to all the resources. They're on top. Why would they want to dismantle it? And governments are not on our side yet. Um, and so, like South Africa, the Palestinians have one strong, powerful ally, and that's you, the international civil society. What, South, what the ANC did in South Africa was bypass the white population there. It bypassed the, the declared government, the apartheid government, and it went directly to the international civil society, the people, churches, trade unions, university groups, political groups, human rights groups. You know, all of us of a certain age were engaged in the anti-apartheid movement. And where it was different from BDS, and here I disagree a little bit with Haider, is that the, the, the ANC, the anti-apartheid movement, always had an end game. The end game was one person, one vote. That's what we were fighting for, everybody in the world. And when Mandela had to come up against the clerk with all kinds of suggestions of power sharing and this and that, he had an end game that he could, that he could uh, uh, stick with and eventually achieve. We don't have that. You know, the two-state solution is gone. There's a vacuum, there's a void, which leaves all of you abroad. You might be supporting Palestinian rights. You do BDS, you do a very important campaigns. What you're doing is important, but without an end game, you're floundering. What are we, what are we selling? What are we, at, what are we BDSing for? And those three elements are important, but they're not a political program. And so I think what, what the One Democratic State campaign is trying to do, me and Haider and, and the others, is to insert a political program, an end game into our struggle that empowers all of us. And with that focus and that direction, and you on our side, we'll be able to change government policies towards Israel. Because I think Israel has, 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 even though Israel's strong with governments, it's lost the support of the public of the people. And we have to build on that. But the only way we can build on that effectively is by advocating for a political solution. And the only political solution that will resolve a settler colonial issue is decolonization and the establishment of a single democratic state over all of historic Palestine. Thank you, um, everyone. I mean, how do you follow Jeff and Haida, right? I would like to thank Socialist Alliance and the Green Left for organizing this forum and for making sure that we keep having these important conversations. Um, as a Palestinian who was born and raised in Akka in 1948, uh, also known as Israel today, in a highly hostile environment uh, that you know, treats my mere existence as a, as a threat, I would like to acknowledge the inspiring struggle of, of First Nation people here in Australia, a struggle that has paved the way for many, for many of us to continue our fight for justice, equality, and peace. I also acknowledge the ongoing impact of settler colonial states on colonized people and colonized land. I'm very privileged to be here uh, in NARM, also known as Melbourne, on Wurundjeri country of Kulin nations, this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, to address the main questions of tonight's forum, the first one, which is, um, why is Israel an apartheid state? Um, and the second one, uh, what kind of strategies um, do we as Palestinians or as solidarity movement uh, deploy in order to fight um, against uh, settler colonial um, aggressive policies. And, and that is my little one who just joined the forum, um, little Rami. Um, so why is Israel an apartheid state? Um, 
plain and simple, it is an apartheid state because this is the lived experience of 14 million Palestinians who have been affected in one way or another by the oppressive power structures that Israel has created since 1948. One shouldn't need to wait for an Israeli or an international organization to issue a report that is based on our lived experience and underpinned by our lived experience uh, to be convinced that Israel is an entity that was built on the ruins and ashes of indigenous people in Palestine, a settler colonial state that has created structures to maintain its domination over Palestinian land and people, and one, um, um, one of those structure happens to be an apartheid, uh, similar, to the, similar to the one that we have, uh, we have had in South Africa. Now, today Israel actually has gone past the point of apartheid, if you ask me, and that is where I concur with Haidar. I think today um, Israel is a, is a state that practices genocidal policies against the Palestinian people. Now, we've seen that um, these policies being deployed or being played out uh, in, you know, most recent example in Gaza. Um, in Gaza, we have the illegal and inhumane siege that blocks almost 2 million Palestinians um, um, in what has been labeled or described as the largest open air prison in the world and using, uses uh, cutting edge military equipment to demonstrate the colonial logic, Patrick Wolf's colonial logic of uh, elimination and murders children as they sleep peacefully in their beds, as we've all seen. Um, it targets civilians and it targets civilian infrastructure. There's no mistake, there's no confusion around that. The main target of Israeli attacks are civilian people. Um, in the West Bank, we have, um, you know, that logic of, of elimination manifests through um, the ongoing expansion of settlements, um, land grab, ongoing ethnic cleansing, as, we've, as we see unfolding today in Sheikh Jarrah, in Silwan, and other parts of Jerusalem. Um, the apartheid can be seen very clearly through the checkpoint system. Every city in the West Bank is suffocated and surrounded by uh, checkpoints. Um, the permit system, Palestinians in the West Bank cannot leave without um, permits from the Israeli Authority, including those who work in Israel um, and have to commute back and forth uh, for their livelihood. Um, restrictions of movement, the apartheid world, the apartheid world's clear case of Bantustans. Um, in 1948, or inside Israel, uh, there are over 65 laws um, that discriminate against Palestinian citizens of Israel, um, from land ownership to family reunification, uh, citizenship, and most recently, the nation state law that was mentioned by both speakers Jeff and Haidar. So that law, what, what it did, it basically, it was just formalizing what Israel um, has been practicing since its inception. Um, and what we have been saying as Palestinians about Israel for decades, that it's not a democracy, it's not a democratic state, it's an ethnocracy, it's a democracy for Jews only, and therefore it's a Jewish uh, supremacist uh, project. Um, so these laws have been put in place to maintain and uphold these power structures in a way that protects the privileges of the settler group and perpetuate uh, the in injustices against Palestinians. Um, this is why, by the way, the Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court and the Attorney General, um, the Israeli Attorney General, were never gonna de deliver a just resolution for um, the Palestinian families in Sheikh Jarrah when it comes to their, uh, the forceful the eviction uh, from their homes. So, it is apartheid because every Palestinian you'll ever meet has been victimized by Israel in one way or another, uh, whether through denial of right of return, for instance, uh, such as in, in the case of Palestinian diaspora and refugees, uh, loss of lands and properties, uh, loss of friends and families, loss of social cohesion, the destruction of the Palestinian society, um, loss of identity and culture, um, 
every Palestinian is still grappling with the impact and implications of the ongoing Nakba. Um, the, the Zionist Settler Colonial Project targets the social fabric of the Palestinian people. It targets the nationhood. It tries to fragment the Palestinians into subgroups, divide and segregate them from one another. For instance, one of the examples is that Palestinians in 1948 um, in Israel cannot marry uh, whomever, who, whomever they want. Uh, they can't marry Palestinians from 1967 territories, and that's the West, West Bank and Gaza. Um, that's because of the family reunification law that uh, Israel introduced that basically prevents Palestinians from these territories or Pal Palestinians from diaspora or refugee camps to basically return. Um, it's, it's a way to um, um, deny, another way to deny the right of return, basically. So we need a marriage equality campaign for Palestinians in Israel as well. Um, it is apartheid because we, um, a key actor in this context, say so. And when it comes to Palestine, we are subject matter experts. And Palestinian issues, we are subject matter experts. We speak from our firsthand lived experience. And that should have been enough 20 years ago, right after the Oslo Accords, and the second intifada when we were saying, this is an apartheid uh, and this is settler colonialism. Um, now, there's no doubt that the, the scene is changing and the tide is turning. And we can see that Israel is losing the public opinion battle. Now, as this happens, um, Israel is just gonna keep pushing um, for some form of validation for its existence as a Jewish supremacy, and will keep seeking normalization through international, but also regional, um, and even domestic actors, um, which is the case of um, the case that was mentioned by Jeff um, of now the uh, Islamic Party that is joining the coalition of either Bennett or we don't know if this is gonna, still going to. Um, go on and become a reality or and still negotiating or not negotiating with Netanyahu at this stage. But uh, this is something that Israel will continue to do, um, especially when we have a situation where Palestinians are, um, uh, they, they keep proving once again that we are one nation. And we, you can't fracture the Palestinians. Uh, for as long as they have been trying, it's almost impossible to disconnect and detach Palestinians from their cause. Which brings me to the second question about strategies, by the way, and, and what can we do as Palestinians, um, as solidarity movements, um, in order to support the struggle, the struggle for justice, uh, freedom and equality in Palestine? Um, now, I think as Palestinians, I think we must insist on a solution that addresses all of our subgroups, a solution that speaks to, in, to the entirety of the Palestinian experience, and a solution that is based on our fundamental values of one nation, one land, and one struggle. Now, we need to get our house in order. We need to get rid of the restricting mechanisms um, and structures that the Oslo Accords have imposed on us. Um, and we need to demand proper representation, representation and new leadership. Um, now, mo most recently, we've seen um, a new campaign launched by Palestinians all around the globe, Palestinians in the diaspora, um, along with Palestinians in 1948, and Palestinians in the Gaza and in West Bank. So this campaign calls basically, uh, it's called the, the Palestinian uh, National Campaign for the Rebuilding of the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization as the umbrella organization that contains uh, and houses all of the other um, uh, political organizations or parties um, uh, that represent the Palestinian people, including Palestinians in the diaspora and Palestinians in 1948 um, or Israel. We must demand nothing less than complete decolonization, um, freedom, equality, and justice from the river to the sea. That's, it's not a motto, it's something that we must insist on and we have to keep pushing for 
because this is um, nothing else is going to work. No other solution that leaves out any part of the Palestinian people is going to be sustainable. Um, the other part of the strategy uh, question, which is solidarity movements. And what can we do um, as solidarity movements, for instance, here in Australia, in order to support uh, the struggle of the Palestinian people? I think it is important, first of all, to highlight that the Palestinian struggle is not a unique struggle. It is a part, uh, um, it's connected to other struggles around the world. For instance, First Nation people here in Australia, but also other parts of the world. Um, it is at its core an anti-colonial and anti-racist struggle. And we must, um, um, we must highlight that part, that at its core, it's anti-colonial and anti-racist. Um, but also we have to keep in mind that <laughs> When it comes to Palestine, there is no hard and fast rules. That this, this is a situation that is not going to be resolved tomorrow or next year. So we all um, we all know that we're in this for the long haul, um, and maybe do not necessarily have to expect uh, immediate outcomes, uh, but know that every uh, every push, every little uh, growth matters. Uh, the other thing what we can do here in Australia is that we need to help build the movement. Uh, we need a strong and wide and sustainable movement that is embedded and grounded in community here in Australia, but also guided by the struggle of our people back home in Palestine, uh, the people who are directly in contact with occupation um, um, and have to live with basically what it what it means to be under like settler colonial uh, state on a daily basis. I think for the, the movement here in Australia, every opportunity is an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity for us to grow the movement. Um, and that's how we measure success. Um, the last and obvious thing that we can do uh, is support um, the, BDS, the BDS call uh, and BDS movement, a call by civil society organizations in Palestine, um, call to boycott and divest and sanction. You know, we can do that on an individual level as consumers. We have to mind the products that we're using or we're buying, we're purchasing. Uh, we can sign petitions. We can lobby our MPs and our politicians um, to end complicity um, in Israeli war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, now, as I said earlier, this is not something that is going to be resolved in the next year, at least, uh, but it's definitely something that is doable within our lifetime. Um, I think, as Jeff and Haidar mentioned, there's already a one state existing. Now, what we need to do, we need to make sure that we dismantle and decolonize all these power structures, all of these oppressive structures that Israel has created from the siege to the checkpoints, to the wall, <laughs> to the ongoing ethnic cleansing, to these laws, racist and discriminatory, discriminatory laws, we can change those. It's, it, this situation is man-made. Um, there's no reason why we cannot reverse it uh, and build a, a place that is better and safer and more peaceful for everyone, but above all, a just place, a place that does the Palestinian people who are the indigenous people uh, of the land, justice. Um, and thank you. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks, everyone, for turning up. And I have also got the problem of following everyone else. Um, so, yes, my name is Ari uh, Hybrits, if you want the, you know, anglicized version. Uh, I echo, want to echo the respects to the Wurundjeri people whose land was never ceded, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, always was, always will be, Aboriginal land. Um, I'm, my talk is going to veer a little bit away from the specifics of Palestine, um, which I think has been pretty extensively covered by people who have much more knowledge about it than I do. Uh, what I want to talk about is primarily why 
Israel is supported by settler colonialist and imperial powers like the US, Europe, the UK, and Australia. Uh, I want to touch on the Israel lobby briefly uh, before talking primarily about Israel's wars with Egypt and Lebanon, and then close with the downfall of apartheid South Africa, which uh, seems to be a popular topic, and what lessons can be found there in terms of the opposition to apartheid Israel. Uh, I'll start with the obvious, which is the US does not support Israel because of the Israel lobby or because of the Zionist lobby. Maybe the Israel lobby gets aid increased or newer, fancier weapons for their genocide against Palestine. Maybe. But the Israel lobby wouldn't exist without the US, UK, European, and Australian funding. Um, the idea that the Israel lobby has so much power over, especially United States pro Israel policy, is something of a red herring or misdirect that can obscure the real reason why the US supported the establishment of the Israeli state and has backed them to the hilt ever since. Um, the US backs Israel for the same reason it backed apartheid South Africa, which is to have a reliable ally in the region, which is to say that Israel is an outpost of imperial power. Israel was established in a period when there were mass revolutionary movements throughout the colonial world, including the Middle East, opposing imperial and colonialist power. And my grandfather and a few, the few of his siblings and cousins who survived the Holocaust went to the Mandate for Palestine, which was the British administered territory at the time, the British colonized territory. And my grandfather fought, the, fought for the Haganah in 1947 and 1948. And for those who aren't aware, the Haganah became the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. Uh, my grandfather said that he only fought against the British who were opposing Jewish immigration to the mandate, mandate for Palestine. Um, the Haganah did not only attack the British, though it's possible that my grandfather did time scale wise. They also attacked Palestinian uprisings and protests against both British and Jewish colonial power, as well as Palestinian civilians trying to live their own lives. Uh, I would say technically they're not responsible for the kind of the mass killings, but those were offshoots. So that's a, a question. Uh, I bring up the Haganah and particularly their role in suppressing Palestinian uprisings against both Jewish settlers and British control because Israel's role has changed very little since then. As an outreach of imperialist power, Israel's presence can be seen as an enforcement mechanism of the kind of the quote unquote Western interests. For example, the tripartite aggression or the Suez crisis, where Israel led an invasion of Egypt after Jamal Abdel Nasser, president of Egypt at the time, nationalized the Suez Canal as part of sweeping land reforms. Uh, Israel led the invasion in 1956 and was soon backed up by Britain and France. And though <clears throat> they technically failed, they didn't retake the Suez Canal, one of the results was the Straits of Tehran being opened to Israeli shipping. Um, Jamal Abdel Nasser was a key leader or key figure of the pan-Arab unity movement, a kind of anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist movement, which sought to unify the Arab world. Uh, he resigned for a while as president of Egypt after Egypt's loss in the Six Day War, which we've been talking about, um, <clears throat> but I'm terrible with numbers and forgot to write it in my notes, so apologies for that, uh, wherein the in sudden invasion by Israel led to the occupation of Gaza, the West Bank, Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, Nasser returned to his position fairly quickly, but his kind of progressive reform and pan-Arab aspirations were hampered by, extended con by the extended conflict with Israel over the occupied territory invaded during the Six-Day War. The, the tripartite aggression is a very obvious case of Israel's role in upholding imperial power and supporting global capital against local progressive reform. As Israel led a retaliatory invasion against Nasser's attempt to control his country's land to control the Egypt's own territory. But I'd also make a point of the continued conflict, the continued fighting between Egypt and Israel as, <clears throat> pardon me, because of a kind of secondary effect, which was to interfere with especially NASA's pan-Arab unity efforts and his progressive movement progressive being a you know relative term but whatever uh the other example i want to talk about is the 1982 israeli invasion of lebanon during the lebanese civil war um ariel sharon 
who later became president of Israel, who's been mentioned, planned and led the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Uh, Israel had allied them had allied themselves with the pro-Western, pro-imperialist Maronite militias, whose domination of the Lebanese government was kind of a major inciting factor in the civil war to begin with, and thus. Israel was there specifically to fight against the pan-Arabist and pro-democratic forces in Lebanon. Uh, during the invasion of Lebanon, Israeli forces and their allies killed tens of thousands of people, um, <clears throat> pardon me, and left nearly a million people homeless. Uh, the Sabra and Shatila, I don't know if that's how you pronounce them, sorry, refugee camps were totally destroyed and Beirut was bombed and devastated. And at the end of two months, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, agreed to pull out of Beirut after the U.S. promised that the Palestinian and Lebanese civilian <clears throat> population would be protected and that the Israeli military would not enter the city. However, Sharon approved a plan for the Maronite phalangists to enter the camp to murder, rape, and torture Palestinian and Lebanese civilians. While the exact death toll is kind of unknowable, it's estimated to be a, at least 2,000 people. Um, Hezbollah uh, emerged as a response in a, to a large degree to the 1982 invasion of Lebanon by Israel and their 1985 constitution pushed, pushed democratic ideals saying roughly that the people should be allowed to choose whatever form of government they want. Um, though Hezbollah being Islamic said that they would hope that people would pick Islamic government. Uh, but Hezbollah is anti-imperialist and anti-Zionist and they're allies of Hamas. So, like, I think for people who aren't that familiar with um, the Hezbollah or, say, Islam, Islamic precepts about government and stuff, don't think of, like, Iran when you think of Islamic government. But um, that's sort of an aside. Israel's continued attacks on Lebanon and a lot of their bombing of Syria during the ongoing civil war has been specifically to target Hezbollah. Um, Hezbollah, though, they're kind of an increasingly complicated organization. Uh, has They administered a large part of Lebanon for a while and were known for providing better social services and like schools, hospitals, that sort of thing, better infrastructure than the kind of quote unquote official Lebanese government. And Israel's continued conflict with them can only really hurt the civilians and, um, <clears throat> pardon me, can only really hurt the civilians of Lebanon and Syria. But beyond that, we can see Israel joining the Lebanese civil war on the side of pro-Western, um, sorry, on the side of the kind of pro-Western, pro-imperialist Maronites and fighting against the left as another example of their role protecting imperial power and global North capital in the area as they once again opposed, um, <clears throat> pardon me, once again opposed reformist or national like uh, pro-Arab movements. Um, to switch gears a little bit, much of the propaganda around uh, the support of Israel is the claim that it's democratic. And as um, previous speakers have mentioned, <clears throat> particularly Jeff and Haider, that that is dubious even talking about Israel's own election system. But, <clears throat> pardon me, but then also as a kind of US client state, so to speak, that it is very congruent with the U.S. conception of democracy. That all of the all of the United States invasions and coups around the world, regime change, all that stuff, they all claim it's in the name of democracy. But you don't have to push far to find that that's nonsense. The lie to Israel's claim to support democracy, other than what I've just mentioned, is that as soon as the people of Gaza voted for government by Hamas, as uh, Haidar mentioned, they were punished for their democratic vote by being blockaded into the tiny strip of land with no way in or out. Hamas won the 2006 um, election because they opposed the Oslo Peace Accords, which clearly didn't do any good for Palestinians for the, or Palestine. Instead, they the Palestine continued to lose hand lose land, houses, and people to the Israeli government's colonization and the building of a wall through the West Bank that separated Palestinian communities. Um, <clears throat> and all of this to supposedly oppose Hamas for being a, a terrorist organization, you know, having a history of pro-Palestinian attacks on Israel. But the reality is that those attacks were self-defense, a right that is 
very frequently, as uh, I think both Haidar and Jeff mentioned, held up on behalf of Israel, but is met with genocidal violence when expressed by Palestinians. Um, and at the start of this talk, I mentioned South Africa and the US support of apartheid. <clears throat> and it's been covered fairly extensively by the other speakers, but the apartheid South Africa was brought down by a mass popular worldwide mobilization. Like we might think of sanctions or boycotts or embargoes or whatever, official actions, but that was pushed by popular mobilization. And <clears throat> pardon me. And that's sort of, that's the need that we have now, as we have been talking about, to, we need to have that same sort of popular mobilization against Israel to propose sanctions. Uh, we've been talking about the BDS movement to um, promote boycotts, divestment, sanctions against Israel. And, um, <clears throat> you know, once the lockdown lifts in Melbourne, pro-Palestine actions will be able to resume. And we can hope that they won't lose steam after the ceasefire and the enforced break of the lockdown. Um, and... <clears throat> Pardon me. The on the Free Palestine Melbourne website, if people are interested, they have a lot of information about what to do next, what we can do next. And one of the things that they have is the kind of local or Melbourne based boycott campaigns. So one of the focus of our protests could be Israeli weapons manufacturers that the Australian government and the Victorian government have relationships with, which is Raytheon and Elbit Systems. Uh, you know, breaking Australian ties with Israel should be an important focus of the solidarity campaigns. Um, Australia is also negotiating a free trade agreement with Israel, and we should be opposing that, which would also, that would increase the exploitation of the Palestinian people and the amount of resources available to Israel. I doubt it. It's not going to be quick or easy, as we've been talking about, and more life will be lost in the process in Palestine. Uh, but with the total blockade of Gaza and the occupation of all Palestine, it isn't possible for there really to be a military win against Israel, which is one of the most high tech and well supplied armies in the world. And this means that international solidarity is especially important, but not just when Israel is dropping bombs all the time. And that's where BDS can be important. That's where local boycotts, local pickets, that sort of thing can be really important. And provide a good focus for solidarity campaigning. Just because most of us are outside of Israel and Palestine doesn't mean we can't do anything. Um, thank you for listening. That's all from me.